capitalism, all of the gains in automation, it goes to the owner class. All you have to do is have everyone be an owner, and now suddenly, any gain in automation is a gain for everybody. If you grow just one thing, it may not grow as well as if it grows with another thing. A good example of that is called the, the Three Sisters Method of Farming. There is definitely multi-apartment buildings or multi-families that do do a path of A hundred million dollars that they gave to Joe Rogan that they would kind of be out if they bring is that a bigger number or is two billion a bigger number i don't know Zach. it's a tough one i know it's really hard and maybe maybe yes. comparing numbers is not uh jeremy strong gotta go kill a jenny so i don't think you should kill her i don't think it's a good idea it's a ghost dude welcome back everybody to bread theory so today uh in honor of pride month and also the the recent uh juneteenth i thought we would take a look at a very important historical figure. Hey, James, how you doing tonight? Good to have you. Uh, I thought we'd look at a very uh, important historical figure in the fight for gay liberation and gay rights. Um, and that person is Marsha P. Johnson. So I have found a documentary about her. And I thought we would just kind of watch it together and react. Because this, this is someone that I don't actually know that much about. I've heard the name, you know, again and again. But never just haven't yet taken the time to to dig more into her biography so i thought it'd be a good opportunity to do so all right let's set that up right now there we go um i think i'm gonna leave it like that. Hopefully that's still big enough for you to, to follow along. If it's too small, just let me know. But anyway, um, from what little I, I do know, uh, she was, she's been credited as the person who kicked off the Stonewall riots. Stonewall riots being an event where the police were literally cracking skulls of people who were just at a, a gay bar, um, I believe in San Francisco. And uh, the gay bars were illegal, so they were they were trying to raid the club and and um, beating people up. And she was credited with just basically saying enough is enough and hurling a brick at the cops, which caused the the people there to literally fight back and push the the cops off. And eventually, this this led to what is now the modern day movement for um, gay rights, gay liberation, trans rights. Um, and just uh, everything that that has come from that. Oh, that's good. You can try. You can switch over to Twitch, James. It's it's okay to to switch between. Um, and it really doesn't. If you haven't set it up yet, it really doesn't take that long. You basically just have to have username and password, and uh, and they may make you verify with your email. But it, it's really quick. So you could even do it while you're you're watching from. Uh, wherever you're watching from. A little bit easier if you're on a computer rather than a phone. So I don't know what, what your situation is, but it's really, it's not that hard to set up a Twitch account. And if you have a an, an Amazon Prime account, you can link your Amazon Prime to your Twitch account. There's some tab you have to go to and it's a pretty quick and easy process. Same sort of thing like verifying an email. And then if you do that, you get a free subscription. You're on the Selly Telly, that's fine. Uh, well, if you do do that, you get a free subscription every month um, if you also happen to have Amazon Prime. So it's a way to take some money out of Bezos's pocket and put it into the pocket of streamers you like. And then, of course, if you subscribe to my channel, I have custom emotes and, you know, there's other things you can do. I've set up a bunch of stuff that you can do in chat. There's games you can play. Uh, you can ask the, the eight ball a question. Um, I'm not sure if I allowed gambling with with channel points, but that that's a possibility too. A whole bunch of different things, and you can you can find a whole list of the commands um, if you go to Twitch and and type in I think commands. I would have to I would have to look. Um, but yeah, it's it's really not that hard anyway. All right, well let's get into the documentary. Uh, there's some music at the beginning here, so I'm gonna have to skip forward 
but uh, it, it's not the critical stuff anyway. I'm mostly concerned with kind of listening to what she has to say. There are some some brief interview clips uh, kind of sprinkled throughout. I did a quick um, scrub of the video to, to see what it was all about. And so, yeah, I'm mostly interested in hearing her in her own voice. But it, it is nice to hear the stories that, that, you know, friends and loved ones and family members uh, perhaps told about her as well. So, anyway, let's get into it. Just never knew how to tell you. I would tell be able what? to talk about my life. Can you see what? Yeah, I have a two arms. You want me to say it out loud? And link the video uh, for your knowledge in case you would like to look at it later on. So that's the current vid. So, up on the screen right now. Whoops. No, it's not the one I wanted. I wanted this one. What is the point of compliance? It doesn't get you nowhere. I might be crazy, but that don't make me wrong. Nobody promised you tomorrow. These are all quotes from Marsha P. Johnson. And I think the music's coming in now, so we're going to skip the music. And we're going to get into the... The embodiment of human rights. If you're black, you're acting as a female. The law's against you, society's against you, everything is against you in those days. Marsha was having a very rough time. And sat there and just said, you know, I don't know if I should take a shower or go to Bellevue. And I think she took a shower. Marsha was a subculture within a subculture. It didn't bother her. She didn't hide from it. You know, she met it. She, she met it head on. Roy was a young hooker, 18 years old when I met him. And he mentioned Marsha, that he went to the village and hung out with Marsha. And I said, I don't think Marsha's the kind of person you should want to hang out with. Marsha, when I saw her in the flower, just getting crowned holy by people from India. She knows something that I don't know. I met Marsha on Christopher Street. And the first time I saw her, I said, who is it this person? I remember seeing Marsha walk down the street in a mini skirt that he had made with nothing on underneath. And it was clearly Don't see like that. Clearly. And she'd be coming up Christopher Street with the roll down stockings, fuzzy slippers, her wig and beer can rollers. Hello, everybody. What a wonderful morning. Over the top with the jewelry, flowers in her hair, very creative looking, very commanding of attention, not wanting to get it, but just getting it anyway. I always remember knowing Marsha P. Johnson. I must have known her before I was nine or ten maybe younger. She would hang out with my father a lot in the kitchen. I remember them spending a lot of time talking in the kitchen. And when my father would leave, if he would leave to go do an errand or if he would leave to do something, she would stay with me. So in some ways, I guess you could say Marsha P was a babysitter of mine. Uh, March is like a Bodhisattva. Her presence on Sheridan Square or on Christopher Street or wherever she stopped and asked for spare change or chatted with people. It was a religious, holy experience. And all of us who did drag or partial drag always admired her and thought of her as a, a patron saint. She had this kind of glow about her. She's like an angel. Her spirit shine through her. My father thought that her heart was in the right place, that she was someone to be trusted. I mean, she, she'd always take five bucks, but she would always say, and, and I'm going to give you back 20, Tony. And she meant it. She meant it because she had a generous heart and a generous spirit, but also because she was convinced she was going to get this billionaire boyfriend, and she was going to be living great with him. Marcia was one of those colorful New York characters that you would see bouncing around the piers or the village in plastic and lame and glittery things and hoop earrings and I always wondered who was that and she always said hello and I did a little research at the time and turned out she wasn't just a kook she was a serious activist and entertainer. She floored every audience they just adored her and I kept wondering what the hell is it? When I think of Marsha P. Johnson I think of someone who kids today who are gay know nothing about which is a shame really because She's one of the reasons they are sitting in all their liberated glory today. But uh, Marsha paid the price for who she was. Okay, I'm going to have to skip through this music too. How old were you when you started young, wearing dresses? When I was young and naive, when I started so wearing some dresses of the, in the five years old, and I stopped for a long time because the boys next door used to try and get fresh with me, you know, oh, trying oh, to oh, have oh. Sex. Honey, I don't think you should have sex until after you're married. 
I found out that boys do have sex when I was raped by this boy mm -hmm. who was about, uh, he was about 13 years old and he put me in between my legs and, uh, you know, he, he shot all this sticky stuff all okay. over my legs. Hold on. And I, I'm going to have to add, add a content warning. I didn't know it was going to be this sort of discussion. Uh, let me let me just go ahead and add a, a content warning. Go. All right, back into it. I, I somewhat knew that boys had sex with boys because the boy next door and they used to jerk off together, you know. Okay. And we used to rub each other's stuff, but that was uh, a little child thing when I was about 12 years old, you know. But I didn't think they'd have to stick it in or want to stop it or anything. I didn't think people had sex, period. I'm still like that. I think. Oh, he wouldn't do that. Oh, no, he wouldn't lift that man's house. Oh, no. She, he would eat that, that girl wouldn't eat that girl out. That guy wouldn't eat that girl out. I know you're not thinking like that, but I know that they would when I go to the movies. Honey, I don't believe you should have sex until after you're married. Or at least that's the way I would, you know, think it should be. I got married to Jesus Christ in church when I was 16 years old. And still in high school, and I haven't married anybody in church since then, because I think he's the only man I could really trust. It's just like a spirit that follows me around, you know, and helps me out my hours and need, and listens to all my problems and never laughs at me. <laughs> he takes me very seriously. Oh, that's that's that was unexpected. I did not expect her to be Christian. Uh, the church has never been very welcoming in general, especially uh, back in the day. Not not at all welcoming of any LGBTQIA people. And though some have, uh, you know, progressed, for the most part they haven't. So, very interesting to, to still believe in a philosophy that, that most of the practitioners reject you just for being you. I started coming to New York and meeting painted queens, and I didn't meet drag queens, as you would say, drag queens, until like in uh, early 60s. That the world was so different then was gay people were scheduled for non-existence. In other words, we were supposed to have no reality called gay, homosexual, except to be in a mental institution getting shock treatments or getting fired from a job. I knew her from the mid-60s and through the 70s, and Marsha always gave this blessed presence and encouragement to be who you wanted to be. Those who were a little too feminine were frowned upon, but Marsha and a few others would stand ramrod straight, shoulders back, head high, and present themselves, and that encouraged so many people, or gave happiness to people, said, I wish I had the guts to do that. She would sort of hold court in Sheridan Square and saying, we're in the village, we're free, live. Queens that used to just wear a little bit of makeup and go out into the street and boys' clothes and turn dates. There was no place as a, a safe haven for a gay kid. The only place, option you had was a bar, or to pick up a John to find a place to stay for the night if you were a young, you know, street kid, and it was cold out, or that was it. You really didn't have many options. When I first met Marsha in the early 70s, Marsha was homeless. I know some of the girls would live in various places for short periods of time. They would get a, a hotel room or, or the baths. She used to stay a lot. And totally agree, James. Be who you are and what you are not, and and what you are not, what the majority thinks you should be. And not what the majority thinks you should be, yeah. 
I, I agree, but yeah. <laughs> As we've been learning also in, in going through people's history of the United States, this country was founded on a mountain of prejudice about so many people. Um, and it's been a very, very gradual uh, process of slowly gaining the semblance of rights for various groups, including gay people. And now the, the front line is, is, is trans people. People are having their, their same moral panics today that they had about gay people in the 90s um, and before, of course. But it seemed to really heat up. And maybe it was just I was becoming more, you know, socially aware in the 90s. Um, but it seemed like there was kind of a, a big tipping point there. Um, and then there was all the, the uh, endless debate. I had so many dumb debates with people about gay marriage before that became the law of the land in the U.S. Mm -hmm. How the sky was going to fall. It was going to ruin all marriages. It would make, it would invalidate marriages. Everyone would just start getting divorced. And all. you just like, any bad thing could be pinned on, on gay marriage. Hey, and none of that happened. <laughs> none of that happened at all. Um, in fact, the divorce rate has gone down since gay marriage has become legal. Funny that. <laughs> you allow more people to get married that actually want to get married, and you have less divorces. Um, the founding fathers didn't get along with anyone, except the other founding fathers, says James. Definitely. <laughs> they, they were very special, yet incredibly fragile little boys who felt that white people were just the master race, white men in particular. Um, I, I, I mean, of course, there were gay and trans people back then. They just were probably either not spoken of at all or just routinely murdered, I would imagine. Um, so that probably wasn't even on their radar as, as much of a possibility. But... Yeah, had it been, I'm sure they would have been prejudiced against them too and found ways to disenfranchise them from voting and becoming elected representatives and all the, all the like. So, all right, continuing on in the dock. And there was a place in Brooklyn, a house in Brooklyn where the girls lived for a while, but none of those things lasted very long. Sometimes I really wondered how she got through it. And then I and just look at this, look at what it means to not rigidly conform to heteronormativity in the 60s and 70s it meant facing death on a daily basis uh, if you were especially if you were out it uh, i mean way more than than happens now would mean that you risk being completely rejected by everybody you know thrown out on the street and you know the, the, he was talking about how they have had to have survival sex in order to survive that, that's a common um, survival strategy, especially amongst uh, homeless youth who don't have a lot of opportunities for jobs. Even um, I did I did homeless outreach when I was in AmeriCorps, and and I met those sorts of people um, that were on the streets, and they'd be like, "Oh yeah, you know, I I have to sell my ass to to make it. That's just the reality of things." And um, it's 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 sad to put people in that position where they have to do that sort of thing and and that's not to say that that sex work is inherently a bad thing but when you're doing it just to survive just to get by and have a warm meal and a warm bed for the night then there's not a lot of choice in that matter um, and in fact if sex work were legalized of course that would not help the the underage people but for at least people that were, that are of age, uh, who found themselves in really terrible home situations, um, it would be an option for them, if if they so chose, to have it on, uh, you know, have employment on uh, a more safer basis uh, with protections. So, you know. The, it, w it would not be something that people would necessarily be forced into at that point. But anyway, I digress. Let, let's keep going. I know she used to sleep in the movies too on 42nd Street. 
It was 99 cents before noon, so she'd get up there before noon and she would sleep up there if she needed a place to sleep. It was amazing. It really was amazing how he was able to survive and get through, through life without having a place to really call home. Marsha had a following around town of like, people that, I mean, I, I go to the flower district, and, and they have these big tables where they sort like lilies and things. Marsha would be sleeping under them. And I saw this more than once. And I would say to the guy there, why is she here? And, and the guy would just say, oh, she's holy. And, and, and there were all these people that like had whatever was going on in their head, Marsha became this, this, and then they would, she would stay there and they would give her Marsha, the leftover flowers, tons and tons of daffodils. Maybe she'd take her last $10 and go out the door and come back 20 minutes later with this big bouquet, $10 worth of flowers. And I'd say, Marsha, what are you doing wasting your last $10 on flowers? And she'd go in my back room and be putting them in her hair and making this incredible arrangement. She'd say, oh, don't worry, Mr. Wicker. She said, these flowers are going to make me a lot of money. And they would. She walked around decked in flowers a lot, remember? That's where she get those to throw oh, it in. Well, she always had flowers in Yeah. She yeah, put yeah, Christmas yeah. lights in, and the Christmas lights lit up. <laughs> Roy was a young hooker, 18 years old when I met him. To make a long story short, he ended up staying here. I sort of took him in. He essentially became my adopted son. And one night, he said to me, it was very cold out, about 10 degrees, he said, could Marsha come and sleep here? Because, you know, she didn't mind sleeping on the floor. Marsha likes to sleep on the floor. Which I thought, now, Willie, you never lie. Why did you tell me a fib like that? And so I allowed Marsha to come in that night, and she was here for the next 12 years. Oh, wow. I've never, ever done drag seriously. I always just do drag. I never do it seriously, because I don't have the money to do serious drag. Years ago, I used to have to get some of my stuff and it out of the trash can and bring it home and wash it. I've never been an extravagant type drag queen that can go out to a very fancy store in town and buy expensive dress. I've always had to get my dresses donated, or I have to get them at a thrift shop or something like that. Because those are the only ones that really got real nice stuff at cheap prices. And her taking us to a Salvation Army and other thrift shops was an art form because she knew for $5, maybe $3, you should be able to get yourself an outfit. Unless, of course, you can get a friend that, you know, has no address and costs to donate it to you. And that's not too often because once they see you and see how good you look, a lot of them go home and get on their dress try and come out and twice, it's good. Marsha had a long purple lilac gown that she favored, and by the time she finished fixing it, a cut here and, and scissors here and a razor blade here for the bottom and gussied it up with glitter, and yeah. she favored that. I mean, I know that that dress really got her working out. She wore that one for a long time. Marsha lived with me here in Hoboken. Now this is a high-rise building. Our apartment is always notorious as being the gay apartment because of the strange people that came and went. So I told Marsha, no problem living here, but you can't come and go from this building in drag because I was afraid that would be pushing things too far. So she would wear bulky clothing and get on this path train and then the dress would drop out from underneath the leather jacket. And by the time she hit Christopher Street, she would have transformed herself into a drag queen, except for these huge, clunky male shoes that were about size 12 or something. She wasn't the kind of queen who questioned her drag, because she had very little. And, you know, she wasn't well-dressed, coordinated kind of drag queen. She put on what was available and what, you know, fulfilled her idea of being a woman to some extent. It was a very, very natural look, and all her own, I mean. It was amazing to me that all these people held Marsh, and these were people from like all over the world, that, that like, I don't know what the concept was going on there. She would go out and stand on the corner and people knew her and they'd take pictures with her. Or she'd say, could you spare some change for a starving actress? One of the great things about Marsh's friendliness is that there was no agenda to it. I had the feeling that she probably had no idea who I was, just like I didn't know who she was. But she always said hello. She always broke that wall and was friendly the way most New Yorkers aren't. Not because she wanted an item. She was just... So I was mistaken. I, I thought Stone Mall took place in San Francisco, but apparently it was New York. So, correction on that. On the surface, a really happy-go-lucky person. Could you give me a dollar? Do you have a dollar for a dying 
drag queen or a star queen. It was sort of a Robin Hood. She would ask for money from people who were in the street going by and say, for instance, they would give her some money. Uh, two minutes later, she'd turn around and give it to somebody else who needed it. She'd say, here, honey, get yourself something to eat. She would not argue or fight the people who insulted her. Why don't you get off Christopher Street? You're giving us a bad name. She was like the mayor of Christopher Street. And the queens definitely crossed the street or went around the block with their johns. They wouldn't be caught dead with her because they were too highfalutin. They had the look, but not the spirit. Marsha had the spirit. She just didn't nod or acknowledge you. She turned around and said hello. She was always like that, which gave you a chance, even fleetingly, to know her. Uh, she was warm. So everybody knew Marsha, and no one had anything bad to say about Marsha. Marsha was really well liked. That, that's just incredible to have that heart of a life from the get go, from even being a, a very small child to still somehow hold on to your humanity and, and just be, as they say, just like bursting with warmth for everyone that you meet. That's, that's pretty amazing. Bars and establishments, 86 her, and she said, if they don't want me in their establishment, even to buy a, a soda or something, I'll go somewhere else. I don't look for trouble. Homophobia in the gay community, you know, she used to say that some of the queens treated their dogs better than they treated her. They would go by and say, what is it? She would say right to them, you know, what do you care what it is? You're not giving it anything. Hell yeah. I didn't get into it right away. I was like the butch makeup queen working at Granny's Garage. And then I started doing little different drag. And I started wearing little high heel shoes, you know. And I started putting on stockings. And I started becoming a drag queen. Well, hello to you too, Natalie. Nice of you to drop by, even if you can't stay all that long. Uh, we, we are looking at um, famous trans uh, LGBTQIA uh, liberation icon, Marsha P. Johnson, and her, her story. I was one of the Stonewall girls, one of the first girls to ever come in drag to the Stonewall. 1969, when the Stonewall riot started, that's when I started my little rioting. When Jerry Hoos, who was the founder of the Gay Liberation Front, arrived at the Stonewall Inn that night, uh, he was met by his friend John Goodman. And John Goodman told him that the soon after Jackie Harmona started fighting the police, that both Marsha Johnson and Zazu Nova joined in. I've been gay liberation ever since the first time in 1969. I was in the Stonewall riots. After the riots, Morty Manford and Marty Robinson, both very important figures in the Gay Activist Alliance, both told Robin Souza that Marsha Johnson was involved in starting the riots. The story that Robin Souza then told me was that Marsha Johnson said, I got my civil rights and then threw a shot glass into a mirror, and that started the riots. Uh, in GAA, this became known as the shot glass that was heard around the world. <laughs> in this case, the mythology reflects the facts, and I think that when we weigh all the evidence together, we have to conclude it's extremely likely that she was among the first to physically resist the police. A spark comes along and it's like near gasoline and it goes kabang, and that's what happened that night. And so don't ever think that if there were no stone wall, that, that it would just be like it is now, because it was a horrible world before that. We were all runaways, and some of them were like 14 years old. Some people had scalding water thrown on them by their parents. People that couldn't go back home no matter what, and couldn't go back to school no matter what. And, and that group of people was the catalyst in the riot. It was the street kids who had nothing to lose that were the force that got it going. History isn't something that you look back at. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that how you hear this sort of a story time and time again, that it's not just some hero that rises up from the midst of, of the people to, to lead them or anything like that. When these movements spark off, when they kick off, it's usually one or more often a group of people they just get pushed too far. They get pushed past the point where they can feel they can make it anymore. Um, 
and then they just say we've had enough and they push back so i found yeah i found that very interesting you see that a lot in in say like uh unions uh starting to form people walking out on on the on the job it's someone that just gets pushed too far so yeah and in fact with with all the stress of of covid in recent years i'd say it's not at all coincidental that we now see a rise of union organization like we haven't seen since probably the 70s if not earlier people got pushed too far people had just had enough and they, they said we got to do something about this so very cool and say oh that's inevitable that would have happened anyway no it happens because people make decisions that are sometimes very impulsive and of the moment but those moments are cumulative realities why are you here today and that's the thing too i think that, that that's very important what he pointed out. I, I like this guy of all the the commentators so far this guy with the beard i think he's he's got it pretty well understood you know he's like you know these things are impulsive you don't always plan these things out ahead of time like the stonewall riot was not planned out ahead of it's not like they planned it was like oh let's let's bait them into raiding us so that we can start throwing bricks and shot glasses or, or whatever we have at them uh no this is just an impulsive moment that that was the flashpoint um and these 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 sorts of clubs because they were illegal raided all the time so it's not as though this is the the first time this happened it was just the the final straw then i'm sure it's not the final time it happened either but it was just the final straw for for a few people and they decided to push back so yeah very interesting the way that 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 movements build um seemingly off of a small spark uh from something that happens routinely. Uh, it's like the, you know, the George, George Floyd protests when they broke out around the world. We had the largest protest movement in world history. That came from one police murder, uh, but there had been hundreds, thousands, perhaps documented the same brutality, the same level before that time. So for whatever reason, the right combination of, of time and place just made a lot of people spontaneously say, this is enough. We got to do something about this. It's pretty cool. Hey. Darling, I want my gay rights now. And that's when I started my little writing. I want to get into this fabulous little dress and this fabulous little hairdo here and, and learn how to do makeup and come out, because I found out that my body was worth the money in those days. I found out if you're a pretty boy or a pretty little transvestite, you can make a couple little dollars, and that's when I learned how to hustle. And then I, I found out the prettier you look as a little boy, or the prettier you look as a little boy made up as a girl, that's the most money you're going to make. And the best way to do it is with your own natural hair. Wigs and stuff like that were in the 60s, but the ones that used to make the most money was the boys that looked like girls and could wear their own hair with just a little bit of makeup and have a little hormone tits, because that's when the girls' hormones start coming out in the 60s just before the done more right. And people were just starting to really get into it. And I used to be down before it was as fancy as it is now. <laughs> I think that was a bad transcription. It was not the Dumb War riot. I think I think she said the Stonewall riot. That's that uh, New York accent, though. Now we all hung out there. We went sunbathing, and I would be sitting there, and suddenly Marsha would come along and grab my shirt. Mm -hmm. and say, she always called me by my two names, Bob Kohler. Never called me Bob ever. And she said, Bob Kohler, give me. And she's put on. I said, Marsha, would you stop? And suddenly Marsha would be naked, stark naked, in broad daylight down at the pier. And I say, Marsha, so she, my father needs those clothes. And I would be hanging on to my clothes for dear life. And Marsha would be trying to get them off. And 
she would usually get just like a shirt at the most, and then she'd throw it in, and these were sacrifices to her father and to Neptune, who got all mixed <laughs> up together. Marcia only very rarely talked about her father. She did tell me once when she, she had looked into the river and seen her father at the bottom of the river. She was making offerings of flowers and change to King Neptune as an appeasement to help her friends who are on the other side. Then she would, after she settled all of that and sort of snarled at me for not giving all my clothing, she would go up Christopher Street where she would be picked up about midway. I mean, somebody would seize Marsha, you know, naked queen walking up the street, and uh, they would call, and they would take her away for about two or three months, and they would put an implant in her spine, of Thorzine, I think it was, and that would calm her down. Then she would come back. She'd be like a zombie for about a month, and then she'd be the old Marsha, and back to Neptune and her father. My first youngest, my five mental breakdown we started in 1970. And that was then it started falling downhill. And it's been falling up and downhill ever since. Mm -hmm. Honey, I walked right down to Andrew Walpole's office. And walked in. He took some photos and then he made a group of silk screens. And it's called Ladies and Gentlemen. And he had me as a, a blonde with ponytail called Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Well, Andy Warhol was the arbiter of what was fabulous, let's face it. When he walked into a room, you knew it was a room worth being in, and he would handpick by yeah. his visual sense. Who I, th I think he was a bit overrated, I gotta say. Um, and he sounded like <laughs> a pretty terrible misogynist at that, so. Yeah, I don't have much use for, for Andy Warhol. It was worth capturing, whether in a painting or a Polaroid. For him to do a Polaroid of Marsha makes her legendary. It means she caught the eye of Andy Warhol. She was worth capturing. She was like... The yeah, yeah. I, I, I wish she would give a, a little more detail. I mean, maybe it's a very par painful part of her life. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if she just didn't want to talk about it. But yeah, I, I don't know what, what was happening. Would, was, was she having a, a psychotic break? Uh, and that, that can cause people to do things like just you know, take off all their clothes and think there's, they're giving offerings to the gods and, you know, that, that, that might track or that might just be a quirky thing to do. And perhaps they were, I mean, what were they treating her for? Were they treating her for mental illness? Were they treating her for what they classified as mental illness? Uh, being that she was trans because that was, was still classified as mental illness in the sixties and seventies. I'm not even sure when it was declassified, but it wasn't all that long ago. This transgender version of a Campbell soup can, but much prettier. I was no one, nobody from Nowheresville until I became a drag queen. That's what made me in New York. That's what made me in New Jersey. That's what made me in the world. We went on Christopher Street. They had a silk screen of Marsha. And they threw us out of the store. They called her Riff Raff. Really? She got, she, we went to look at her silk screen. She was so proud of it. And we got thrown out of the store. When I became a drag queen, I started to live my life as a woman. Marsha's success in life wasn't something that suddenly happened because Andy Warhol did a portrait of her. Andy Warhol did a portrait of her after she literally had become a larger than life legend by having converted so many people into fans and friends to going out. She'd always say little things to people like, have a nice day. It seemed to me, I thought, well, you know, do those, but it's funny, those things must matter because she had a special way of making a little extra effort to be extra polite, nice to people. And that really made people love Marsha. The people get lost in the telling of the story. They want the bigger picture, what's going to be there. That there was a riot and this is what happened. That there were drag queens. They don't really get into the individual people who were more than the Stonewall riot. I mean, these were people that were bigger than life that walked the streets here. And Marsha is, is like in the class of what? saint of gay life. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, if you ever hear of this old Russian tradition that was called uh, Fools for God. Friends and many people who knew Marsha called her Saint Marsha. 
because she was so generous and she was such a good person, a little queen would come up and say, Marsha, that brooch is so beautiful. And Marsha would say, oh, you like it? Take it right off and give it to her. She was simple, pure. She had her bad days and she'd let you know it. She had so many breakdowns. And the gay community recognized she was a saint. That's never been done in their lifetime. It's so practical too, you know. Marsha was totally mad, but one of the most greatest geni there, okay. geniuses on the face of the earth. She was outrageous in a different manner, and she was noticed first for that. But uh, talk then started about her activism. It made her very different. It made people think twice about her, and made people want to stop to talk to her, and made people listen. You've been I working? I've been gay, never raised, never Gay rights for a while now. I'm glad they're finally getting into this almost almost halfway through. But I mean, it's it's interesting to hear the backstory and then the biography a bit. But it's really the the activism and, and what she was standing for politically that I, I was most interested in her as a figure for. Drag queens to try and help the drag queens and other people have boo at the alternate you. Alternate U was one of the places that we first tried to help college queens open their doors to gay liberation. When I started getting in newspapers, on TV set for gay pride parades, I was one of the queens that helped feed the queens that were hungry. And I started the Star House, but I didn't actually start the Star House. Sylvia Rivera started the Star House. And I was just one of the queens that was behind her, like the vice president of Star. I knew Marsha was very into political activity in the West Village in the 60s and the 70s. And the group of, I guess they were all transvestites, called themselves Star. S-T-A-R. Street Transvestite Activist Revolutionary. Which made a lot of sense, and I thought it was kind of hilarious. Because they were all stars anyway. Sylvia Lee Rivera deserves all the credit for Star. Revolutionary because she was one of the people that was in the riots that got arrested a lot for gay rights. One big thing in Marsha's life and also in Sylvia's life was that they had formed a group called STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. And they had managed to get some small-time mobster who ran a porno store to give them uh, an apartment or something in the Lower East Side in this slum building, which for a few months they operated as a shelter for homeless transgender youth. And they felt that That's that amazing. was one of their great accomplishments in life. And actually that has ended up going into the history book because it was really the first time anyone had ever tried to make an outreach to homeless transgender community, especially youth. God, that's just so... That's just so disgusting that that's the first time anyone's even considered, oh, hey, maybe those are people too that we need to help. Oh, maybe they're struggling just like other people on the street, but then have extra complications because they're literally, sh literally shunned from most places of employment uh, and, uh, you know, routinely harassed and beaten by police and by regular, you know, non-police civilians. And that's the first time. Well, I mean, that's good though that it, it finally started somewhere, but wow. What a country we live in. They were kicked out of their home for being transgendered. She was talking about nobody's representing her and her rights as a transvestite. Because they had all these gay men and all these gay women working at the gay center, but they didn't have any transvestites. You know? She wanted to have her own group, and I think that was wonderful. And I hope someday she Gets her credit. I hope somebody writes a nice story about her someday. Well, Marsha, how are you, darling? How's it going to say Pride Week? Oh, well, it's going fine so far. I've got a t shirt on Christmas Street in case anybody's interested from 2 to 4 tomorrow. I read my part in the gay movement this year to help raise money for the gay Pride March. I was working as a waiter for Charles restaurant, and all people used to do was sit there complaining about their hamburgers. 
All right, Dad, honey, I'm not going to want to be a hamburger jingler for the rest of my life. I want to be a drag queen. I want to be one of the world's biggest drag queens. So I got an offer from the Hot Peaches in the 70s. Anything went with the Hot Peaches. It really pushed the edge back when there was an edge to push. And it was sort of like the coquettes goes maybe more theatrical and more legit. As she became the proverbial hit. And Jimmy was the original one who first came and he asked me to be in theater, Jimmy Kamichi. So I was just, I was curious, so I looked it up. And in fact, there is a full length documentary that came out in 2017 about uh, Marsha P. Johnson. And it goes, I think it focuses mostly on her murder, it sounds like, and then tries to tie her struggles to modern day struggles with LGBTQIA issues. So here's a little Wikipedia article for you. Man, Wikipedia has some long URLs, but whatever. Anyway, if you're interested in, in learning even more, looks like that's a, a good place to to start. Yeah. Well, Jimmy Kamicha, the leader of the uh, Hot Peaches, he always saw talent Hot underneath Peaches. you, and he liked flamboyant people, <laughs> and and then he could bring it out. He could bring the talent out, and I thought he brought a lot of it out in Marsha. Uh, Marsha was a very big performer. I mean, really very large on stage, and that doesn't ever come across on, on video. When I say she was big, the generosity of her spirit was always right there in front of the audience. And they adored it. It was not censored. It was not figured out. It was just there. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Marsha B. Johnson! There's another link to another uh, dramatization of, of her life about the moments that led up to the Stonewall riot and stuff like that. It's called Happy Birthday, Marsha. It's apparently on Amazon Prime, and I found out that uh, Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson is on Netflix right now. So you can check it out in those places. I'll see if I can find anything else, too. The generosity of spirit. You know, you can't record kindness. It, it, it just didn't work, but when you saw it... it we're now going to give you one more time love by Marsha P. And I gave her this little song to sing. Now, most songs are like three minutes long. This song was maybe 50 seconds. So, and she read it, the whole thing, you know. And she went out every night. It was a simple song. And she obliterated this song. I mean, it was a d d disaster. But they loved it. They went berserk. So one day I said to her, Marsha, this is a very short song. Let me go over it with you so and show you how to sing it properly. And, you know, this way you go out there and it'll be really nice. So she said, okay. So I go over the song with her and she gets it perfectly. She goes out that night. She sings it perfectly. Big round of applause. She comes off. I said, Marsha, that was great. Next night, she goes out on the stage. She ruins the number, just destroying it. They go berserk. She came off stage and said, Marsha, what happened? She said, they like it better that way. <laughs> <laughs> and
and, and, and they did. And now, ladies and gentlemen, in case you didn't get the message, but I know you did, because I can see that this audience is the message. We have someone to sum it up for you, Miss Marsha P. Johnson. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am to say a poem for you called Self. You can count your karma if Nirvana is your goal. You can shake and you can rattle. You can rock and roll. You can be a Clark Kent or a Lois or an Alice down a hole. You can be a vampire on a mountain with the heart of stone black hole. You can be a leather angel on a sleek black holly bike or a redhead screaming faggot or a dazzling dyke. You can lock yourself in a closet in a fine mean stall, but it really doesn't matter if you ain't got soul. And the funny thing is they kept writing in the paper, uh, oh, one of the best things in the show is Marsha P. Johnson, but we think she was having an off night. <laughs> I used to make like $125 an hour working up on Broadway. I was in and out of those hotels like nobody's business. The Hotel Dixie, which reformed and called itself the Carter Hotel, was a sleazy bag that some of us who were on 42nd Street, you, uh, you could rent by the hour. It, it had full of characters, and some of them not too, you know, too wholesome. No, it was a dangerous life she was living. I mean, I lived, lived a dangerous life, but you would not find me in the Dixie, you know. I mean, these people really were on the edge. I had so much trouble. It's a miracle I'm still here. I mean, how many people used to come and bring guns? By the late 60s, probably around the 70s, this was a very, very dangerous period. I mean, gays were beaten up just for wearing tennis sneakers. Never mind a wig. And Marsha was the perfect target. Some boys that had nothing to do, roughs, had grabbed her wig and threw it into the river. And then she protested and complained. They threw her after. And I said, well, she's dead. They said, oh, no, they just threw her in the river. I just couldn't imagine being in that river and surviving. I said, she must have swim. I mean, there were things, uh, layers of information about Marsha, you know. She must be a good swimmer. She must not hold on to a pier, and she certainly could climb very well, because the river may not look far away, but how do you get out of it? So I was fascinated by the story. Then when I saw her, you know, she was fine. She never answered that. She just went, oh, that. You know, when I tried to bring up the story. I mean, how many people used to come and bring guns and pull guns out on me because they didn't think I was, you know, I would tell them I was a boy and I was in drag, and I was... I would tell them that I would go like hustling and would they want to go out? And they say, yes, I want to go out. And then when they get up in the hotel and I take off my all my clothes, they say, I can't believe it, you're a boy. That I noticed me and couldn't sleep. I was a real woman, honey. I'm just a transvestite. And then I look in the mirror and I said, maybe he could have thought I was. I don't know. I wouldn't be for sure. Because I'd be so happily painted. Maybe it's because of my boy. I don't know. And yeah, but just once in a while I was running to this lunatic who would actually have in his mind that I was a woman. And I mean I'd tell him I was a boy and they just wouldn't you know, they just wouldn't believe it because I'd seen everything down my pants and everything. Another day, another illusion. <laughs> I have been arrested about a million times for prostitution, from New York to Florida to California. Marsha would frequently disappear for four, five, six, seven days at a time. And I'd say to Willie, where is Marsha? And he'd say, she must be in jail. And sure enough, about 10 days later, she would walk in because she had gotten a 30-day sentence. They always let her out after 10 days, even though she had 30. I'm telling you, every time they pick you up, they pick you up for something like Lord of Rings, 
uh, with the intent to prostitute or something like that most of the time. Because a smart prostitute never goes out in the car and names a prostitute. They always treat me like I'm the world's murderer. The highest murderer in the world. As though I was arrested. I mean, they think I'm out here to murder people instead of have sex with them for money. There's a P in my name also. They call me Marsha Payton on my job. I try and pay a lot of those little things that happen to me in my Absolutely no mind. It was Marsha P. Johnson, mm -hmm. and the P stood for pay it no mind. <laughs> uh, which, Marsha, which Marsha once told the judge, I went down to bail her out of court, and Marsha was in the docket, and she came up, and Bruce Rice looked at it, and he said, uh, Marsha P. Johnson, and she said, uh, she had a very flat voice, we used to call it a field voice, and she said, yes, and uh, he said, what is... The P stand for, and she had the nerve to snap judge right. She said, pay it no mind. <laughs> and he said, well, that's exactly what I'm going to do. He said, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> pay no mind, Johnson. Marsha, pay no mind, Johnson. I recently saw the name Marsha P. Johnson is a drag queen name because I used to go down to 42nd Street, and everybody used to call me Michelle. And I was a little boy, and I didn't think that was a nice name for a boy. That's why I got the name Johnson from Howard Johnson's Restaurant. And I'm every year in a Stonewall car lately. There was a time when they didn't even want me in a Stonewall car. Harry Chapride, who runs the Gay March and the Gay Festival, tried to ban transvestites from the parade in like 1978. And yes, there are fellow gay men who... I, I, I'm having trouble here. It seems as though Marsha uses transvestite interchangeably with, with transgender. I'm not sure if this guy is using it that way as well. Um, I mean, either way, it's it's kind of an out-of-fashion term. You would say maybe a cross-dresser or uh, someone who does drag. Um, you don't really say transvestite anymore. So I, I'm not quite sure... Yeah, yeah, I guess I'm just not quite sure about that, if that's what it's supposed to mean. Would cast a, an evil eye at you and say, oh, they're giving us a bad name. Because after all, I mean, all you turn on TV, there was a gay pride parade and all they showed were the drag queens. So what Sylvia and Marcia did is they went ahead of the opening banner and as two transvestites, I guess, with some friends, they marched in front of the parade that so made them end up leading the whole parade. So the the... the uh, yeah, I'm getting the feeling that by transvestite they just mean someone who lives as the, the gender they were not assigned as birth. I guess that would be my, my, my thoughts from the context clues, but I don't really know the evolution of that, that term. Whether the transvestite meant something similar to transgender, um, or what? The committee decided, well, we've got to include transvestites in our parade. Ed Murphy was the one that put me in the Stonewall car in 1980. He took me from the back of the parade and put me up front. But he yet evidently watched me through the years since 1969 and evidently thought that I had a right to be in that contingent of, of the parade and put me there. I never wanted to be there. I didn't care where I marched in that gay liberation parade ever since it first started because I didn't think that was important. Well, Marsha was born for a parade. I mean, look at her. You know, so it was only natural she would go to the gay pride parade. Uh, she was somebody who put her life on the line. Uh, people think, uh, oh, the gay community just happened this way. It didn't. There were people like Marsha literally in the street, not just celebrating, but fighting for rights. I think they're important. I think that's something that, that uh, reactionaries and, and just run-of-the-mill conservatives don't really understand about various prides, not just gay pride, but, but any sort of ethnic pride uh, celebration, is that it's not just about everybody look at us, you know, look at what, look, you know, be in your face, this is what we are, that sort of thing. That may be a very small side part of it, but as I understand it, it's, it's much more about we are coming together as a group to show that we are not afraid and that we are going to fight for rights together. 
it's 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 much more about solidarity than about uh, than about even visibility, I would say. Um, at least that's my assessment. This is from an outside perspective, too. I've never been to a gay pride parade. I've never participated in gay pride events myself. But so this is just my my take on it. So take it for what what you will. The first thing was that we got our gay rights all across America and across the world, and got the right to be human beings just like other human beings. I wanted to see gays at least have a thought in life because they've never really had anything called a parade that was their own. You know, they always had to hide in the closet of somebody else's parade. Yes, I know tons of people that have been sick with me. I mean, I don't think that you should be ashamed of anybody you know to have AIDS. I think you should stand as close to them as you can and help them out as much as you can. I'm a strong believer in that, and that's how come I try and do that for everybody I know that has the virus, including myself. I have HIV. I've been HIV for about two years. I mean, from helping sick people with AIDS and stuff, I, that's how I wound up in the hospital. I just finished helping my roommate suffer who had died of AIDS. Marsha lived here, and Marsha literally became the uh, nurse for David. I had to go to work, and she was here all the time, and she would change the linens and, and come in once he fell off the couch, and she swept him up in his arms. I had to sit in the room with him when he died, and that was very scary to me. I, I had a breakdown because I never had to sit in the room with anybody when they were like guys before. I thought that it would be screaming and hollering and everything when you didn't do any other things. You just stop breathing all of a sudden. And then when I just had a breakdown, I wanted to put a hospital. Now they got two. That's just a, a horror I cannot imagine uh, having to witness so many friends and, and you know fellow activists and colleagues and stuff like that one by one succumb to a really awful disease and like you know oh of course the the, the aids virus the hiv virus is not the thing that kills you it's it's the fact that you don't have an immune system so any number of terrible things can just waltz right in and and kill you but that means a lot of really horrible stuff that can affect you. Uh, I, I can't even imagine going through that period. Fuck, fuck Ronald Reagan so hard for, why is this coming up now? Uh, for ignoring the AIDS crisis, being completely callous to it. He was, man, between him and Andrew Jackson, it's hard to pick who the worst president of all time was, but I would bet it would be, either of those two would probably fit the bill pretty well. Worse than Trump, even. Uh, Trump Trump is a reflection of a, of a time and place more than anything, uh, of, of just a reactionary spirit as, uh, you know, white people are not uh, as privileged as they, they once were. And, and people's coming to grips with the, the idea that they can't just coast through life um, you know, based on, on being born into a, a good spot and never have to worry about any competition. So, so that's that's a separate thing. Ronald Reagan changed so many policies, destroyed unions, uh, completely heartless when it came to the AIDS crisis. Just a really horrible, horrible human being, horrible president. And then there's, of course, Andrew Jackson, Trail of Tears, many horrible genocidal policies. I, I, I guess, you know, you got to give it to genocide. You know, if you're going to go with the absolute worst. But I would put Reagan a close second. Little nice statues and charities, Square Park, to remember the gay movement. Yes, I mean, that's not to take anything away from uh, from Donald. He was a, he is a vile, psychopathic person. But he didn't do a whole lot when it comes down to it. He couldn't even strike down uh, Obamacare. All he managed to do was get rid of the, the individual mandate. 
Uh, yeah, Carter's 200 years old and still builds houses for people. That's pretty amazing. Um, that's not to say Carter was the greatest president of all time either, by any stretch, but, you know, definitely on the, the good end of just a really horrendous bunch of 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 men. And, and still, that trend continues. We have a, a female vice president, but still yet to have a woman president. <sighs> yeah. So, so anyway. Yeah. Screw Ronald Reagan. That's the, that's the takeaway. How many people have died for these two little statues to be put in the park to recognize gay people? How many years has it taken the people to realize that we're all brothers and sisters and human beings and the human race? That's so true. I mean, how many years does it take people to see that? And we're all in this rat race together. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? All in this rat I race together. I go to St. Mary. I used to use Christ for most of my career, most of the time, because I used the church in Hobo. And I go there every week and not a candle, or I used to go in and say a prayer, you know, for people dying of AIDS. She was very, very religious, and a neighbor came in and told me that at 6 in the morning they had gone to the Catholic Church across the street, and Marcia was prostrate on the floor in front of the statue of the Virgin Mary. And I would find her in the strangest churches, and she'd be dressed in velvet, and she'd be throwing glitter, and she never would face the <laughs> altar when she was praying. She lay prostrate facing the door, because she thought, you don't look at the altar. I practiced the Catholic religion because the Catholic religion part of the Sandria of saints, which says that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Ms. Moshe would always say she went to the Greek church, she went to the Catholic church, she went to the Baptist church, she went to the Jewish temple. She said she was covering all angles. <laughs> She would take her last two dollars. Willie once said to me, we only had two dollars and we bought a box of cookies. And you know, by the time we walked down to the river, Marge had given away all the cookies that we had spent our last two dollars on. The reason for that is because Marsha had been hungry, had lived on the streets, and she knew that a chocolate chip cookie to a starving queen was a great gift. I mean, every once in a while, I just reach my hand out when I have extra dollars and I help somebody. I'm not going to have anything when I die because I don't have any clothes. Now, Jesus, with the loaf of bread and the fish, Marcia always had something to share. Not only her goodwill and thoughts, a bag of potato chips, she would just hand to the group of kids. I got this dress. Oh yeah, this is, this is like the embodiment. This is living mutual aid right here. You see people in need, you plan ahead, you have some some extra, and you give it to them, and that's it. Not, not you know nothing expected in return. You don't expect to be, you know, held up as some great saint or anything like you do because it's, it's the right thing to do. It's like a basic form of mutual aid, but I think it's it's amazing. It's beautiful. Okay, I'm just like Cinderella again. I have this one little tired dress, and I have this here just just in case I meet my billionaire husband. And that's just the only two dresses I own in my whole life. I don't have to do the streets anymore because I decided, John, it wasn't worth it. I never ever had to do the streets in my whole life. I never had to have sex with anybody for money ever. I just only did it because I wanted to see if I could get away with it. And I pretty much succeeded. Yes, I got shot on the West Side Highway. I went out with a taxi cab driver, and a taxi cab driver fucked me, gave me $20, and let me get out of the cab. I went to run away from the taxi, 
and man pulling out a gun and fire was the most serious thing in my whole life. I thought that I was dead that Sunday morning. I said, oh, the Lord is finally calling my name. I'm going home. But they couldn't get the bullet out. It was too close to the spine. Oh, wow. Usually it went in right over here. And the bullet still there after 12 years. <laughs> I'm dying, 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 but ain't dead yet. Being a hooker is no easy business for no one. It's one of the most dangerous business you can be in, but if that's the only thing you know how to do, uh, I say it's a pretty sad, sad story for anyone. <laughs> Not pretty sad, big joy, but she said pretty sad story for anyone. But this more than anything is is the 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 uh, the reason why sex work needs to be made safe and legal because no one should have to endure this these kinds of situations where you could get shot, you know, at, for for what reason even, you know. Someone feels bad about what they've done. Someone thinks they can just rob you. Like, no, this needs to be safe and, and legal and in places where people have control over, you know, their body. And that's the other part of it, too. It's, it's by giving them the, this, this safety and, and control, they get to actually consent to the, the sexual acts. Uh, whereas if you're on the street, you, there's a lot of coercion that can happen, I would imagine. Um, you know, having to be with people you wouldn't normally choose to do so, for whatever reason, being forced into situations you feel are dangerous, being forced to do things that you don't want to do. So, sex work needs to be legal to protect the people that find themselves doing it. And, and you know, I, at an even deeper level, we just need to provide the basics of life for everyone so that only the people that actually want to do that sort of a job as, as their career, um, only they end up doing it. And everyone else has a choice in uh, how they devote their life. So two main components to it. Safety, but then also needs to be undergirded with real choice. And that can only come from uh, having that support platform of the basics of life. You know, prove myself. But I think that I like the store that somebody would want to pay me money. That's what kept me in the business for such a long time. I couldn't believe that my body would ever be worth anything to anyone. I thought they all just thought they could use me. Uh, but that's in a book of matches, you know. They didn't want to give you nothing. Nothing! Not even a cigarette or a cup of coffee. Nothing whatsoever. I thought that was the life that I was going to be living as a homosexual. A person just going out with people and having sex with them on the street inside of a truck. And you have sex for five or ten minutes, they get their rocks off, you get your rocks off, and that's it. I thought that was going to be my whole life story as a homosexual. Which isn't that exciting. It's not like my mother said, you're going to meet this. I wanted to do what my mother said. My mother said, you're going to meet this billionaire homosexual when you grow up, and he's going to take care of you for the rest of your life. My mother said, being homosexual, she's going to have a lower than the door. She said, you're gay, you're lower than the door. But see, my mother never knew much about homosexuality. All she knew was to see men dressed in uh, women's hats and dresses and come to the bar. She, she never investigated. She never came to a gay Yeah, I agree, James. Food, homes, and health for everyone. And then no one has to sell their ass to pay for, for anything. It's, it's only those that, that choose to uh, have that as their career. So... That that's yeah that's the ultimate that's that's the ultimate liberation of people, giving them as much consent as possible to do whatever vocation they are. Because I mean, think about any job you've had. How much did you really consent to doing that particular job? Unless you're an entrepreneur, you're probably not doing it on your own terms. You're probably doing it on someone else's terms for someone else's pay rate, someone else's working conditions. Nothing 
or very little is really determined by you. So if we're going to make consent a, a, a pillar of our society, which it should be, bodily autonomy is very important, I would say. Uh, you have to give people means to actually be able to consent or not consent to any given line of work. Pride my thing that she didn't know that much about homosexuality. And her whole life she never wanted to know much about homosexuality. When I was 18 years old, honey, my mother didn't have to show me a drug. And I had my high school diploma, and that's all I needed in a bag full of clothes. Free at last! Free at last! Thank God the whole party is free at last! Man, I'm so sorry for those of you having to follow along the transcription, uh, the, the, the closed captioning, but it is, is doing a, a god-awful job. I, I think Marcia's accent is just not what the algorithm is used to. And here we are, we, we see a, a, uh, an example, a, clear, a pretty clear example of the biases that supposedly neutral instruments can still come up with you know the algorithm was obviously trained these, these are auto-generated captions and was obviously trained on more of a midwest accent like i have uh not so much the 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 regional new york accident accent that 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 marcia has and then you add on top of that a kind of a, a um a more feminine lilt to the voice to the voice and it, it just is, is not is not doing a good job so i do apologize for that but hopefully between the sound and and the words you're able to pick it up and if, and if you're not able to hear the the sound then i i just i apologize but i don't know what else to do about it sorry for the bus to the port of sorry i said if my mother can move out her own with nothing fifteen dollars it's Stuff, a holy person, a saint, on street corners every day on, on Christopher Street. And people could walk past her, ignore her, and be blind to her. But those who, who saw her and understood, she is a reminder of what the village was and what other younger people can be. Tomorrow night's the candlelight vigil. The candlelight vigil is for people who died of AIDS. And we've been having it for seven years. And I just don't like to miss one because I never know who's next. I never know if it's going to be me or one of my best friends. And I like, and I like to say I, I think that all of us for the day should remember all the courage they had in fighting the disease instead of just laying down and dying, you know. It's going to be the first year that we're marching down Fifth Avenue completely. I believe in as long as there's people with AIDS and as long as gay people don't have their rights all across America, there's no reason for celebration. That's how come I walk every year. That's how come I've been walking for gay rights all these years instead of riding cars and celebrating everything. Because you never completely have your rights 
one person until we all have your right. And I think as long as there's one gay person that has the uh, That's absolutely right. It's, it's like Brother Ali says. Can nobody be free unless we're all free? Um, very true words. And, you know, and she died in, in 92. So she did not even get to see nationwide legalization of, of gay marriage. Um, yeah, she would have been 76 today. Or not, not, not today specifically, but uh, this year. 76th birthday, so could easily still be alive. Very tragic. Um, James says, I asked Rob about the captions before and said they aren't good either. Yeah, Trisha will say something like slumlord or scumbag and the captions say I'm buying a new Ford. Yeah, yeah. I haven't really checked on, I don't keep up the, the captions on Facebook as well. I wonder if they're any better. I'll have to kind of keep an eye on that. But YouTube captions, a little bit garbage. Especially if it's a uh, an, uh, a non-American um, kind of middle class Midwest sort of accent. War, the gay rights, Don, all of us should be war, the gay rights. And if I die, I hope nobody cried either. I hope you think, get up and dance, party, and have a good time. <laughs> Oh, they suck too, James. Oh, that's too bad. Four days after the interview, even the gay pride event, we may have to skip this. Marsha disappeared. Or just, I'll just have to mute it. I think she was getting sicker, uh, and she, I got a phone call, and they said Marsha had come up from the bottom of the river, and it was true. Marsha may have hallucinated and thought she saw her father in the bottom of the river, or might have thought that she could walk home across the river to here in Hoboken on the water, you know, or she could have been harassed and jumped in the river to escape. We'll never really know. The word went out in the community that Marsha had been found in the river and uh, supposedly it was a suicide. And she had been harassed in that area. Obviously, this was some kind of shady killing that had gone on. But unsurprisingly, the cops just twiddled their thumbs and said, no, no, it's a suicide. It's a it's a black gay person. We don't care. We're As if we need any more proof that, that cops are worthless. <laughs> what do they even do? Don't solve murders. That's literally true. Most, the vast majority of murders go unsolved. I don't, well, maybe not even the vast majority. The majority, anyway, of murders go unsolved. Let's, in fact, let's look that up right quick. Because that is a good statistic to know. Well, it just says all oh, homicides. That's homicide is more than just murder. Ho homicide is any time a person kills another person. So it could be vehicular homicide. That's not. It's not exactly as, as though there's as much of a mystery if you have that sort of a circumstance. It looks like about fifty-eight, fifty-nine percent of homicides. Uh, Let's see, one third of murders go unsolved. Okay, maybe not a majority of murders then, but still, that's a big percentage. <laughs> Means if you're a serial killer, every time you, you kill somebody, you got a one in three chance that they're not even gonna put in too much effort to solve it. Wow. Anyway. We're not going to investigate any further. So and I, yeah. Everybody was outraged. Cops, worthless. We gave much of the funeral Especially if it's some church. minority. Uh, we hadn't counted minority in several hundreds of people different coming. Ways, the church was packed. You got no they chance. had to stop the people from coming in. 
and it was going to be carried down to the river. Well, we had arranged to go on the sidewalk, but I looked around and there were literally hundreds and we couldn't. So on the outside, I talked to one of the police, whom I knew. I had a store on Christmas Street, so I knew most of them. I said, look, her family, I can't do it. You know, you've got to give me the street. And we said, we can't give you the street, you need a permit, yada, yada, yada. I said, look, it's for Marsha. And the head cop looked and he said, Marsha was a good queen. He said, go ahead, give them the street. And we got the street for Marsha's funeral. So it was that kind of effect that Marsha would have, which Tommy is talking about, people you wouldn't expect, a chief of police, to suddenly close down 7th Avenue because Marsha Johnson was going to be carried down to the river. Again, I apologize, but can't can't arrest the DMCA. Okay, it's gonna be music now, I guess. 1944 to 92. Inside. All right, so you get some credits here. I think this is going to be the credits. And I will skip forward a little bit here. I think there was one last thing. Yeah, it's still just music. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Oh, you're tomorrow. Yeah, call you tomorrow. Like tomorrow. Watch this outfit, the blue thing. Like tomorrow, we got a different color. I'm sorry. Take care. I will be working. What a cool person. I, I'm, I'm glad we looked at this. I was hoping to, to learn a little bit more about the activism part. Like, Obviously, she she marched and helped organize the the gay pride parades and and events uh, for many years. But uh, I got a I, I have a feeling there's a lot, whole lot more to it, and they didn't really get into that all that much. So a little bit disappointing. Maybe I'll check out some of the other um, movies about her that I that I mentioned earlier, uh, just on my own time, because of course, you know, this is just a, a YouTube movie, so. A little bit looser with regulations there. Um, but yeah, lower middle class white people aren't the high priority either. That's true. Unless you're a business owner. If you're a business owner, you have tons of rights that other people don't have. That, that's what the police are there for, is to protect, you know, business owners. And it's, it's, it's always the, the ironclad talking point. What about the poor small businessman? What, 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 if, what, if he, what if he gets squeezed out of business if you raise the minimum wage? They're always used as a political pawn. And it's like, you know, small business owners have, are still around. And there's been raising of the minimum, minimum wage before. Somehow they adapt to it. And then also, if you're not willing to give your employees what you give yourself maybe you don't deserve to be in business it's just a thought but uh, but yeah especially in Appalachia that's that's very true James that's kind of the forgotten part of of the country it's it's very tragic protect the assets not the people that made the assets yep yeah, our, that that is what our founding fathers wanted. They wanted uh, private property to be protected because they wanted to be the ruling class. They were they were sick of being even minimally under the thumb of the the aristocracy, the monarchy of England, and so they wanted to take over in their place. So. Like, can you imagine that <laughs> being like still the richest class of people in a country, but because there's other rich people that can sometimes tell you what to do, <laughs> you convince poor people to overthrow that monarchy and basically install you and try and you and your way of life in, into law uh, to be protected into perpetuity.
Yeah, it's crazy. It's a crazy country to live in. Well, that was a good documentary, though. I, I, I'm glad I know a little bit more about Marsha P. Johnson. Um, and I think I'm probably going to leave it there tonight. Let's see what's coming up. I'm not sure if the ladies are going to do Head Theory tomorrow night, but they may keep, you know, keep a lookout for it. I know Trisha was having problems with her Wi-Fi tonight, which is why she couldn't join, unfortunately. Uh, so hopefully she'll figure out some workaround for that. Um, this is now that, yeah, not the second time when she hasn't been able to come on because of technical difficulties. It's been sad to see. They didn't want to pay the queen. They wanted to get slaves to work so they could be their own queens. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, certainly they had slavery under under the aristocracy as well, which made men obscenely wealthy. Um, the South, despite having less than half the, the population of the North, and despite a very small minority of people actually being slave owners, still on average, so that is distributing out those incredibly wealthy slave owners' fortunes amongst all the, if you were to do that, to spread it out evenly amongst all the peoples, had on average more wealth than a northerner. So, slavery was extremely profitable. Um, and so, so I, I, I guess, yeah, I, I guess that was part of the revolution too. They were threatening to do away with slavery because I believe it wasn't that long after. Let's see when it was that the UK did away with slavery. Uh, come on now. Yeah, so they, they ended it 1833. So about 30 years before the US did. So I, I, I guess that couldn't have been too much of a threat because they didn't even do it themselves for 30, you know, actually no, 60 more years after the Revolutionary War. Uh, but anyway, getting off on tangent, as I do. So thank you all for joining. Thank you, James, for your comments. It's uh, nice as always to have you in the chat. And um, since don't have enough people for a raid, We'll just shout out someone on Twitch. We'll see who's streaming now. This will be your opportunity, James, to, to go click over to a cool Twitch channel. Uh, let's see. Who have I not shouted out? I haven't shouted out many people recently. I've been kind of neglecting the Twitch side of things because we just haven't had a lot of Twitch viewers. It's mostly been Facebook. Um, which is great. I, I, you know, I appreciate any viewer I can have. But uh, I feel that Twitch has a unique community and I want to help build it even more. Let's see. Polly People is a cool streamer. We will shout her out. Thank you, James. I appreciate that. That was it was a nice show. Kind of a low-key one this time. But good stuff. So yeah, here's someone to go check out, James. Polly People. Really cool streamer. Uh amazing political takes. I think she has a degree in I want to say she has a degree in political science, but I could be wrong about that. But she knows what she's talking about either way. Oh, Ooh, looking at a modern day debate between Vosh or Vosh, <laughs> but Vosh and uh, Alex Stein, who just looks like a total dickhead. So have fun with that. Modern day debates are, they get to be brutal. I, I try to support the, the debaters that I like, Brenton Langle. Um, Let's see who else goes on there a lot. Ben Burr just goes on a lot. So I try to get through them. But the, the reactionaries they pull are just so insufferable. That, so I mean, most of the time it just evolves into a screaming match anyway. But hopefully at least with poly people bringing you through, it'll, it'll at the very least be entertaining. So go check that out. That's all for me tonight. Look out for, for Head Theory tomorrow night. And if that doesn't happen... Um, you still have 
going to do the 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 SJ Witcher series, continue that on Friday morning. So just hang out, play video games, chat about whatever. Very casual stream. So thanks for thanks for coming by tonight. See you soon.